Hello again, my friends. Okay, today we're going to do uh, Daniel chapter 11. Um, it's quite a long chapter and it's very complicated. It's the most accurate prophecy in the entire Bible, the first half of it. And it's quite long, so I'm going to split this in two. So today we're going to cover the first half. We're going to cover the most accurate part of the Bible in prophecy and then we'll um, explore where it goes from there and what it's talking about in general okay well, first of all here's the beginning of uh, Daniel chapter 11 and I in the first year of Darius the Mede I stood to strengthen and to fortify him so first thing you'll notice this is a continuation so it's continuing from Daniel chapter 10. And we'll just do a very, very fast review so we can be up to speed on what he's talking about. So in the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, so this is when the vision actually happens, which is what we need to know. So it happens in the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia. Daniel had a vision, and um, he saw the... Uh, he was at the ri river Hittical in Susa, and he saw the uh, this this being that looked like a man that had eyes of lightning and torches of fire, and his arms and feet were like brass. And he stood there, and he ended up telling Daniel uh, that there's this battle between angels and the angels are in charge of certain regions or nations and that there's some angels on God's side and some angels not on God's side and some like some opposing them see the chief of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days and behold Michael one of the head chiefs came to help me and I was left there beside the kings of Persia Right, so the chief of Persia was withstanding this angel, or this person, and Michael the archangel came to help him. Okay, and now I will teach you what what will encounter your people in the latter days, because the vision is yet four days. So this is the whole reason for Daniel chapter ten and eleven and twelve it's all one vision so we're this is sort of the introduction of this this being that comes to see Daniel and he's talking about a battle of Persia and Greece but this is during the days of Cyrus there were no battles between Persia and Greece until many years later so these are these are battles with the angels overseeing these places regarding what is going to happen in the future. And he says then he ends chapter 10, nevertheless I will show you the writing in the scroll of truth and no one is supporting me in these things except Michael the chief of your people. Okay? And, and we understood from our last video that we studied this, that Michael is an archangel, or the archangel. And he is the one known in the Hebrew scriptures as the angel of God. It, it ties into Michael. Okay? So, now we're going to start looking at Daniel chapter 11. So this is him telling him, the writing in the scroll of truth. Now he's going to tell him. And, it, and, he, and he, he, I guess chapter 11 should have started the next verse, verse, but he's saying, and I, this angel, or this, this person talking is not Michael the archangel. It's a being. It's a being that looks like a man. Okay. And I, in the first year of Darius the Mede, I stood to strengthen and to fortify him. 
Now, sometimes they will talk about future in the past tense uh, in prophecy. So that, that could be this, because if we look at the lineage of Darius, so here's the lineage of the, the kings of Persia, and here's Daniel here, Cyrus the first, Cyrus the Great, okay? Um, he He's the king when Daniel's having this vision. And then after him came his son, Cambyses the first, then Cyrus the second, Cambyses the second, Bardia was the usurper, and Darius the first was a general of Cyrus. And he came and he, when this Bardia killed the son of Cyrus the second, um, and took over the throne, Darius the general, who was a, a loyal to Cyrus, Cyrus's family, he came and killed Bardia, and he ended up becoming the king, because there was no more lineage of Cyrus left. So, so why is the angel, in the vision that's happening right here during the third year of Cyrus, saying, and Darius, when I stood to strengthen him. Well, it could be because Darius uh, was the general who overthrew the, the, the city of Babylon on behalf of Cyrus the Great. So um, they might have been talking about Darius as the king of Babylon at that time, or the ruler of Babylon. That's a, that's one possibility, and the other possibility is that the angel is speaking in the future, of the future in the past tense, which is common in prophecy. It, it's not a big deal. Okay, so and I in the first year of Darius the Mede, I stood to strengthen and to fortify him. And now I will show to you, so that's sort of a cryptic, cryptic sentence. It's hard to understand what exactly that means. And now I will show the truth to you. Behold, yet three kings standing for Persia, and the fourth will gain riches that are greater than all. And according to the strength in his riches, he shall arouse all the kingdoms of Javan. Now, a lot of English Bibles will translate this, all the kingdoms of Greece. But it, uh, actually it says Javan right here. Malkut Yavan, the kingdoms of Javan. Okay, this is Genesis chapter 10. This is the table of nations. These are the generations of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And unto them were sons born after the flood. The sons of Japheth are Gomer, and Magog, and Madai, and Javan, and Tubal, and Meshech, and Tiras. So Javan is, one, is the fourth son of Japheth. And what uh, Javan is... One of the few of these that are actually known for sure, and it is the Ionians. Now, the Ionians is mainly Greece, but it's actually the people who inhabit all around the Aegean Sea. This here is the Aegean Sea. And there's a lot of islands. There's like thousands of islands in here. And Crete. And this whole area, this, this whole area here is basically one race of people. And that's the Ionians. And in the Bible, that's called Javan. So Greece is, uh, it's, a prop, it's a correct translation, the Greeks. But it's not really that accurate because it, it actually is talking about the Ionians, which is all of these people. Okay, so there will be three kings after Cyrus, yet three kings. So three more kings 
and the fourth would be the rich one that will go after Javan, all, all the kingdoms of Javan, which would mean all the Greek peoples, even on the uh, west coast of Asia Minor and in Greece. Okay, here's Daniel here, or Daniel here is Cy uh, during Cyrus the first. Yet three kings, one, two, three, and the fourth. Now this um, this doesn't count as a king. This guy ruled for like I don't remember. It was less than a year when Darius took over, and and also prophecy. It's not a history lesson. It's it's kind of. Uh, Sometimes it'll only highlight the major kings. It'll say there'll be three. It's meaning there'll be three major kings and then the fourth one. So sometimes it skips over like m kings that don't really matter much or don't count much. They, they only reign for a year or something. It skips them right over sometimes. So counting is not... And, and plus our, our accounts of history are not completely accurate either. We don't have a lot of uh, archaeology on Persia. We have a lot of ancient histories written, but like Herodotus, when was that written? Something like 600 BC or something, or 400 BC. And, and a lot of it is full of uh, legends and fables and, and history. So we have that, and we have a few other Greek histories to look at, and we have a few uh, carvings on mountains, but not a lot other than that. So this may not even be that accurate. But anyway, so we got three kings, one, two, three, and the fourth is Darius the first. Now, it was the king after Darius named Xerxes, who really went after Greece in a big way. But Darius wanted to. It's kind of like when God told David, uh, your son will build a temple to me. And David prepared everything for the temple to be built. He made the plans. He got all the materials. And by the time Solomon was old enough, David said, there you go, build the temple. Well, David did all the plans. He did all the all the hard work of s sorting everything out. And then Solomon did the work of building. So, you know, who really built the temple? Da David and Solomon, you could say. So, this this is the fourth king. Um Darius the 1st. Now, is there any evidence that Darius the 1st went after Greece? Well, yeah, he did. He wanted to. He definitely wanted to. Okay, I have a book right here. Penguin Classics, Herodotus, The Histories. So this is the Greek histories written by Herodotus. And it's, uh, I think it's the first history book ever written in the world that we know of. Okay, so this is Herodotus, the Histories, Book 5, um, number 105, and he talks about the Ionian Revolt. Okay, when Onesilus was busy with the siege of Amathus, news was brought to Darius that Sardis had been taken and burnt by the Athenians and Ionians. Athenians, that would be around Athens, and the Ionians, who I already described. And that the prime mover in the joint enterprise was Aristagoras of Mel Meletus. The story goes that when Darius learnt of the disaster, he did not give a thought to the Ionians knowing perfectly well that the punishment for their revolt would come. But he asked who the Athenians were, and then, on being told, called for his bow, and he took it 
and sent an arrow on the string, shot it up into the air, and cried, Grant, O God, that I may punish the Athenians. And he commanded one of his servants to repeat to him the words, Master, remember the Athenians, three times whenever he sat down to dinner. So that shows how Darius felt about the Ionians and the Athenians. And he started to prepare for war right from that time. And then Xerxes took over after Darius, Darius the second and then the Xerxes or something like that. Um, so that was the beginning of the of the the will to conquer Greece. Okay. So what does the Bible say here? And the fourth will gain riches that are greater than all, and according to the strength in his riches, he shall arouse all the kingdom of Javan. Then uh, verse 3, And a mighty king shall stand, and he will rule a dominion of many, and do according to his pleasure. So now the prophecy jumps ahead to uh, Alexander the Great. So this is why, how it started. It said, okay, there will yet be three kings for Persia, and the fourth will amass everything against the, king, the, the people of Javan, the, Ion, the Ionians. So that was Darius and, or Xerxes, or since the time of Darius, they had this anger towards the Ionians. So that was the whole point of, of, the, of that statement. Because through that anger, Xerxes attacked Greece and did uh, much damage. He, he went across the Hell's Pond and down into here. Uh, there were attacks into Athens. So Alexander the Great, he was uh, the, the king of Macedonia and he united all the Greek armies together and they went in to attack Persia. So Alexander the Great was so successful that he owned all of this Greece. He came in, he took over Egypt, all of Egypt. He came in and took over all of Syria and all of uh, Mesopotamia and all up into here. So he took all of this away from Persia. He, he conquered the entire Persian Empire. So that's what that, ver that's what that verse is about, Alexander the Great. A mighty king will stand. He will rule a dominion of many. So he ruled over Egypt, Syria, Persia, all these places. And when he stands, his kingdom will be broken and divided to four winds of the heavens and not, his, not to his descendants. So Alexander was a young man. He was only in his 20s, I think, when he died, or early 30s. And uh, he had no heir. And so his four generals had a meeting and they divided the whole empire among themselves. So, so, and not to his descendants and not according to his dominion that he ruled, because his kingdom shall be pulled up for others besides these. So this here map is a map of the, the Diadochi which are the four generals after Alexander the Great. And I did this in another video already. This yellow part represents the Seleucid Empire. Seleucus was one of the generals. Ptolemy was another general. And all this blue here, Egypt, uh, this land here, and Cyprus, and this land here, all was, was uh, belonged to po Ptolemy. And these are the two important generals for this prophecy we're studying, these two. And then there was the two others were Macedonia and, and this part here, this brown area.
which is under Lysander, one of the generals, and then Macedonia was under Cassander, one of the generals. But these two are our focus, Ptolemy and Seleucus, because these two are on either side of Jerusalem, D Judea is right here. So these two, as you can see the blue and yellow mixed here, these two are all continually fighting over Judea. It's the king of the north and the king of the south. So now, and the king of the south, now we just explained, that's Ptolemy. He will be strong, but one of his captains will be stronger than him. And he will rule a dominion of many as his dominion. So Ptolemy I was strong. He was the general of Alexander. And he, through this deal, through the deal the four generals made, he got these lands. But his son was stronger than him because his son solidified the dominion over these people. And he started like an Egyptian cult of rulership. Um, he, he became the pharaoh of Egypt and kind of um, brought Egyptian tradition into his rulership and into his leadership. And he solidified this whole thing into this leader cult thing of the Ptolemies. Okay, and in the end of the years, they will unite. And a daughter of the king of the south will come to the king of the north to make agreements. But she will not retain the power of her arm. And he will not stand nor his arm. And she will be given the arm of her. And they that bought her. And he that begat her. And he that strengthened her knows times. Okay, what happened? When Ptolemy II became great, and he decided to make a deal with Antiochus II, who was the king of this Seleucid Empire. And so he sent his daughter named Bernice to marry Antiochus II. Antiochus the second, he died and he left two ambitious mothers. Because when, when, when he married Bernice, he already had a wife named Laodice. And Laodice already had sons who were heirs to the throne. And Antiochus the second, he put away these sons and, and this wife for Bernice. And he had the sons with Bernice. Okay? And then when he died, the two ex-wives, or the two wives, their and their families started a civil war over who gets the, the throne. Okay? Um, and Laodice claimed that Antiochus had named her son heir on his deathbed. But Bernice argued that her newborn son was a legitimate heir. Bernice asked her brother, Ptolemy III, who was the new king in Egypt, to come to Antioch and help to place her son on the throne. But when Ptolemy arrived, Bernice and her child had already been assassinated. So so he's, uh, he's now up in in the Seleucid Empire to help his sister and she's been assassinated her and her son and this other person is on the throne so we'll just read this again just to confirm that that's what it's talking about and in the end of the years they will unite the, the north and the south and the daughter of the king of the south will come to the king of the north and make agreements, but she will not retain the power of her arm, and he will not stand. So the king's dead, she's dead. His arm, and she will be given the arm of her, and they that bought her, or they that brought her, and he that begat her, and he that strengthened her in old times. So she lost everything, they lost everything. This other guy's on the throne. So verse 7, from a branch of her roots, one shall stand in his place. He shall come against the force 
and he shall come into the fortress of the king of the north, and will act, and will act against them, and he will prevail. So Ptolemy the third, who was the son of Ptolemy the second and the brother of Bernice, um, he during his rule, the Ptolemaic kingdom was reached the height of its military and economic power. And he was the brother of Bernice. So he marched along the Levantine coast only to find that his sister had been murdered. So here's the Levantine coast. Up the coast here he marched to find his sister was murdered. He continued his campaign through Syria and into Mesopotamia conquering Babylon. So when he found out his sister was murdered, he conquered this, all of this here. He conquered them. He moved up into here. He conquered here. He went already and went as far as Babylon. He conquered Babylon. So he took all of this for, the, for his Ptolemaic Empire. So that, this was the height. If you turn all of this blue and join this to it all the way to Babylon, that was all part of his empire. So that was the height of the Ptolemaic kingdom. Okay? And it was all because of Bernice. And he, ins he installed a governor in the land beyond the Euphrates. So here's the Euphrates right here. So in the land beyond that, because he had to cross the river, there was only one crossing up here. And another one way down here. So th this was a, like a huge barrier. So he installed a governor across the river. And then he was the king on this side. So he, had, he probably had uh, governors here, here too. And he ruled from uh, Alexandria. And then when news, when news of a revolt back in Egypt broke out, then he ran. He he installed this governor, and he went back to Egypt. So a branch from her roots, from Bernice's roots, shall stand in his place. He shall come against the force, and he shall come into the fortress of the king of the north, and act against them, and he will prevail. And also their gods, with their molten images, with their precious vessels of silver and gold, and ca with captives, he will bring them to Egypt. And he will stand more years than the king of the north. Well, when he returned to Egypt, what had happened is that the um, some previous war, I can't remember what it was. I think what happened was during, during the war of Assyria or Babylon, they invaded Egypt and they carried off all the gold and 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 silver and stuff out of Egypt up into Jerusalem and into uh, Babylon and when Ptolemy the third returned to Egypt he brought all these national treasures back to Egypt and that made him a hero in Egypt so he brought all the molten images and precious vessels and captives back to Egypt and he did live longer than the king of the north. And the king of the south will come into the kingdom and return to his land, which he did. And he outlived Seleucus II by four years. And his sons, the king of the north, will excite themselves and they will assemble many forces. And he will surely come and he will overflow. Now this word overflow... Um, it's the same word they use to rinse. If you're washing your dishes and you rinse off your dishes or something gets dirty and you rinse it off, it's the same word. So to overflow is like to pass through the land and eliminate what you want to eliminate. So he will overflow and pass over and he will return and they will be stirred up as far as his fortress. So Seleucus II, that was the king that was uh, the king of the north when uh, Ptolemy III went all the way into Babylon. He left two sons. 
Seleucus the third and Antiochus the third. And Seleucus the third succeeded his father, but he was assassinated after two years. And Antiochus the third took the throne after him. And this is called Antiochus the Great. He was the greatest king of this uh, Seleucid Empire. And I, Antiochus III, from the past few years of disarray in the kingdom, the kingdom had become fractured. So when Anti Antiochus III took over, okay, because Ptolemy III came up in here, and when he attacked all the way into Babylonia, he ended up leaving this long-lasting kingdom called Coel Syria. And it was sort of like this area here. It was like a big area right in here called Coel Syria. And Antiochus, the seat of their kingdom was up in here, Seleucia, right? So when all this happened, these kingdoms up here that were part of the empire broke away. These kings over here broke away. So his empire was in pieces and it was in ruins. He attacked this Coel Syria right here that belonged to Ptolemy, but he failed. He couldn't get it back. And he sent generals in here to attack, but they had a little bit of success, but not only a little. So then Antiochus III went this way, conquering into here and into here, taking these Bactria and Persia, taking these kingdoms back. And he was successful here. And during this time, Ptolemy III died. And then began the reign of Ptolemy IV. And it began with the murder of the queen mother, Bernice II, and 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 the young king, he was he was um, he was just a child, and he fell under the rule the control of his advisors, and Antiochus the third he saw this as a as a great opportunity, so he launched an invasion of Egypt in 221, but he failed. And in 219, Antiochus captured uh, some Ptolemaic cities along the coast of the Levant, which would be cities along this coast here. He took them back from Ptolemy. And then Ptolemy's advisors began to recruit soldiers. But typically they would only recruit Greek soldiers. But this time they started to recruit Greek and Egyptian soldiers. And they were going to reattack to take back these cities. So the sons of the king of the north will excite themselves and they will assemble many forces and will surely. So the son is Antiochus the third, right? And is, and the second, they, he tried also. And they excited themselves and assembled many forces and he'll come and he'll overflow and pass over. And he will return and they will be stirred up as far as his fortress and the king of the south will be enraged so this is Egypt right and they're gathering an army they will be enraged and he will come out and battle with him with the king of the north and he will stand up a great multitude but the multitude and so the king of the north will stand up a great multitude to stop him but the multitude will be given into the hand of the king of the south so this is uh, this is called the the Battle of Raphia. So the Battle of Raphia happened in here. It, it was it's also called the Battle of Gaza. Um, so it was right in that area with this great battle between the north and the south. It was one of the largest battles of the Hellenistic kingdoms. Antiochus. The, the third had 63,000 soldiers and 100 elephants. And Ptolemy the fourth, his advisors, they had 75,000 soldiers and 73 elephants.
and Antiochus was defeated. So he will stand up a great multitude, but the multitude shall be given into the king of the south hand. So Antiochus was defeated. Verse 12, And when he has lifted up the multitude, his heart will be exalted, and he will cast down tens of thousands, but he will not prevail. So even though Antiochus was defeated at Raphia, he went up in here and he tacked into here, into Asia Minor, and into here to take back some of the kingdom that was lost up there due to revolts. And then he went into Armenia, up in here, attacked into here, took back land up here. And during that time, these two had revolted again, so he went back over here took them back and took, put, brought them in, into submission. And he even went down into here, down into here in a, in a place called Gehens. And he attacked these people and took money from them. And during this time, um, the Ptolemy the fourth dies and the child king Ptolemy the fifth comes to the throne. And this is another child. He's only five years old. So when he has lifted up the multitude, his heart will be exalted, and he will, he will cast down tens of thousands, but he will not prevail. And the king of the nor north will return and cause to stand a greater multitude than the former. And the end of times of years, he will certainly come with a great force and great riches. So, when Ptolemy the, the fifth came to the throne, the child king, Antiochus the third saw this as a great opportunity. First he goes after Telemic land up in Asia Minor. So he, he starts to attack into this stuff here, taking this away from them. And then he made a pact with Philip the fifth of Macedon. So this king over here, he made a pact with him that if they both attack Egypt, then he'll take Egypt and Cyprus, and Philip V could have this part here if he helped him. Antiochus III, he began his attack on Coel Syria, this part here that was owned still by Egypt. He began to attack this, and he, and he besieged Damascus. But the governor of Damascus sent word to Rome asking them for help. Because Rome was an ally of Egypt. Because Egypt was, is known as the breadbasket of the Roman Empire later. Egypt grew a lot of grain. And so they were shipping grain to Rome. And they had a, a, an alliance with each other. And then Antiochus captured Coel Syria. And he went down and he captured Gaza. And the governor of Coel Syria, who was a governor representing Egypt, he switched sides and he joined Antiochus. So they lost Syria, uh, the Ptolemic Coel Syria, to Antiochus III. Then Antiochus went up into here and he started attacking these Greek lands in here. And then they had a, an alliance with Rome. And so they sent messages to Rome asking for help against him. Okay, then the Battle of Panium happened. The Ptolemic generals, they had finally amassed their army big enough, and they moved up into here. And they went up into Panium, which is somewhere up in around here. And this is where the great battle happened, the Battle of Panium. Antiochus gathered an army at Damascus, larger than the army at Raphia. He had 70,000 men and several elephants. And uh, the Ptolemy generals had about 45 to 50,000 men. And Antiochus was victorious. So Antiochus kicked them out and, and he took Coel Syria from Ptolemy. And the king of the north will return and cause to stand a greater multitude than the former in the end of times of years he will certainly come with a great force and great riches. 
And in those times many shall stand up to the king of the south, and the sons of the violent ones of your people shall lift themselves up to establish the vision, but they will stumble. Now, this verse here is probably talking about the Egyptian revolt. Now, I mentioned earlier how the, the generals in Egypt, or the, the counselors in Egypt, had amassed Greek and Egyptian men for their army. Well, the Egyptians, they were like the native peoples of Egypt, and they never liked being overrun by Greeks. And they saw this as their chance to revolt. And there was a revolt that took southern Egypt, or upper Egypt, away from the Ptolemies. And it went on for a few years. And um, Ptolemy V, he launched a massive campaign in 196 BC. And the rebel leaders were captured and pu publicly ex executed in Memphis. As far as uh, the people, the violent ones of your people shall lift themselves up to establish the vision, but they shall stumble. It's kind of... Um, a difficult verse to to um, support here, but there is something that I found in Josephus. Okay, if you're enjoying this video, please hit the like button. It helps our helps out with the algorithms. It doesn't take anything from you. It just you just says you like the video. Okay, now, this book here, Jose Josephus, and this uh, Josephus lived about the, around just after the time of Jesus and he, during the Roman uh, Jew Jewish Wars, and uh, he wrote uh, histories of the Jews uh, that goes all the way back as far as he could, right back to Adam and Eve, basically and tells the whole history of the Jews right up to his time. And so there is something in his books here um, about Antiochus III and about this battle of Panium and, and what, what was going on with his people at that time. So I'll just read from that. Um, in uh, Antiquities of the Jews, Book 12, Chapter 3. Okay, now it happened at the reign of Antiochus the Great, who ruled over all Asia, that the Jews, as well as inhabitants of Coelsyria, suffered greatly, and their land was sorely harassed. For a while he was at war with Ptolemy, Philopater, that's Ptolemy the the fourth and Ptolemy the fifth and and with his son who was called Epiphanes it fell out that these nations were equally sufferers both when he was beaten and when he beat the others so that they were very like a ship in a storm which is tossed by the waves on both sides because the king of the north and the king of the south keep winning back and forth and, and just thus they were in their situations in the middle between Antiochus' prosperity and its change to adversity. But at length, when Antiochus had beaten Ptolemy, he seized upon Judea. And when Philopater was dead, his son sent out a great army under Scopus, the general of the forces against the inhabitants of Colsyria, who took many of their cities, and in particular our nation, which this is the Battle of Panium, right? Which the, when, when he fell upon them, went over to him. Yet it was not long afterward when Antiochus overcame Scopus in a battle fought at the fountains of the Jordan and destroyed a great part of his army. But afterward, when Antiochus subdued those cities, of Coal Syria, which Scopus had gotten into his possession, and Samaria with them, the Jews of their own accord went over to him, and received him into the city, into Jerusalem. 
and gave the plentiful provision to all his army and to his elephants, and readily assisted him when he besieged the garrison which was in the citadel of Jerusalem. So the the Ptolemic forces were uh, were besieged within Jerusalem by Antiochus, and all the Jews around all helped him. They fed his army and they helped him. Wherefore Antiochus thought it was just to requite the Jews' diligence and zeal in his service, so he wrote to the generals of his armies and his friends, and gave testimony to the good behavior of the Jews towards him, and informed them what rewards he had resolved to bestow on them for their behavior. So, you know, at first this, this Antiochus III was very friendly to the Jews, and, and he had a very good, rep, good, um, good relationship with the Jews. But it was his son who went after the Jews. So that's probably what that verse is referring to. Um, and the sons of the violent ones of your people shall lift themselves up to establish the vision. Establish the vision meaning like do the work of God, but they shall stumble because they're not helping a very good person or they're not helping God. They're only helping Antiochus. And the king of the north will come and pour out a mound and he will take the fortified cities and the arms of the south and they will not stand and neither will his chosen pe pe people. They won't have the strength to stand. So Antiochus wins everything, but he also wins Jerusalem. And he also wins the Jews. So they don't have, they lost their independence in, in, in a big way because they chose sides. So after the Battle of Panium, the Ptolemic regiments fled all over. They went they fled to Jerusalem, to Phoenicia, to Samaria, Samaria, Decapolis. So that's basically all around this region here. They they fled into different cities. And Antiochus had to go to each one of these cities and conquer it to get rid of them. So that's probably what that is about. The king of the north will come and pour out a mound or a siege rampart, and he will take the fortified cities and the arms of the south. They will not stand, neither will his chosen people. They won't have the strength to stand. And he that comes against him will do according to his pleasure. None will stand before him. And he will stand in the beautiful land, and it will be consumed by his hand. Now this is an interesting verse. He that comes against him. Well, who comes against him? Um, this, is, this is the beginning of the Ro Roman Seleucid War. The first Roman Seleucid War. Uh, he that comes against him, against the king of the north, against Antiochus, is Rome. Um, after the Battle of Panium, a diplomatic war had begun between Rome and Antiochus III. Okay, Rome saw Asia Minor. See, Rome had had alliances with Greece. All of this and parts of this. And Rome saw this area here as a buffer zone between them and the Seleucid Empire. Meanwhile, Antiochus saw Greece as the buffer zone <laughs> between him and Rome. So, so there's overlapping interests in this area. And they both tried to establish, each, each tried to establish their buffer zones by making alliances with the smaller kingdoms in the area. So Antiochus started making alliances with Greece, with Greek kingdoms, Greece wasn't one kingdom, it was a collection of city-states. So Antiochus is making alliances in here, 
and Rome is making alliances over here. And the Aetolian League triggered a small war which drew Rome and Antiochus into exchanging blows. There was different leagues in Greece. The, the whole nation is all city-states, and these city-states joined leagues. So it's like a, a little group of city-states would join each other, and that was the Aetolian League. I think the Aetolian League was up in here more, and the Ath Athenian League was down here around Athens. So the Aetolian League started a war which drew in Antiochus III and Rome into this one war, into this battle. So this is where they started to fight each other. And that was the Battle of Thermopylae in 191 BC, and Antiochus was defeated. And Antiochus began to have peace negotiations with Rome, but he broke off because of too many demands. And then there was a battle of Magnesia in 190 between Rome and Antiochus. Antiochus was defeated. And then the truce signed in 189 BC, where Antiochus agreed to abandon all claims west of the Tarsus Mountains. The Battle of Magnesia happened somewhere in here, and then Antiochus agreed to uh, stay, not to go west of the Tarsus Mountains. So the Tarsus Mountains is a mountain range that kind of, kind of comes from here down into here, like that. So he agreed to stay away from anything west of the Tarsus Mountains in this agreement called the Treaty of Apamea. And in, in the Treaty of Apamea, Antiochus III's son became a hostage in Rome as part of the treaty. <clears throat> now here's a the terms of the treaty. Antiochus was to abandon and all claims west of the Tarsus Mountains. He was to surrender all war elephants. He was limited to 12 warships to keep his subjects under control. He was banned from recruiting mercenaries north of the Tarsus Mountains. And Rome would select 20 hostages that Antiochus was to give up. And the hostages would be changed every three years, except for his son. His son was permanent hostage. So I think what he, this is talking about Rome, I think. He that comes against him will do according to his pleasure. See, Rome ended up taking everything in the end. They conquered Egypt. They conquered Syria. They conquered Greece. They, they, it all became Rome. None will stand before him. He will stand in the beautiful land that is in Judah, Judea, and it will be consumed by his hand. So Rome, uh, during in 70 AD, during the uh, Ju Jewish-Roman Wars, Rome took Judea, uh, um, banished the Jews from it, and renamed it Palestine. So that's what that's talking about. It's just, just sort of a little preview, an introduction, if you will, of Rome. So now we go back to where where we were in the in the battles, okay? When he starts to have problems with Rome, <clears throat> and he will set his face to come with the authority of all his kingdom and the upright ones with him, this he will do, and a daughter of the woman he shall give to him, destroying her, and she will not stand and not be for him. So first of all, let's just review the relations between Egypt and Rome up to this point. Uh, Ptolemy II, he was the first Ptolemaic pharaoh to enter diplomatic relations with Rome. He remained neutral in the First Punic War between Rome and Carthage. So Carthage is right here, this area. And there, there's the Punic Wars, were wars between Rome and Carthage. 
Uh, the, the general in Carthage was Hannibal. Um, famous wars called the Punic Wars. Ptolemy II remained neutral from that, but he had diplomatic relations. He was selling them grain, right? And Ptolemy IV made an unsuccessful attempt to negotiate a peace between the Roman Republic and Macedonia dur during the First Macedonian War. That was about 215 to 205 BC. Uh, there was wars between Macedonia and Rome because Macedonia was making a treaty with Carthage and they were um, becoming a threat to Rome and so there was a war in there, right? So during that time, um, Ptolemy IV tried to negotiate a peace. Um, and after the Battle of Panium, a Roman embassy made an attempt to negotiate a peace between Ptolemy V and Antiochus III. But they did, but they did not intervene in the war. And Ptolemy ended up losing, Rome's ally, but Rome did nothing about it. And when the Roman Seleucid War broke out between Rome and Antiochus III in 192 BC, um, Ptolemy V sent an embassy to Rome offering financial and military support against Antiochus III. But Rome, the Roman Senate refused it. Uh, they took the, ga the gift and said, well, thanks for the gift, but no thanks. Okay, Ptolemy V sent another embassy to Rome in 191 to congratulate the Senate on its victory. Uh, the Battle of Thermopylae against Antiochus III, uh, proposing further joint actions against Antiochus. Um, so Ptolemy wanted to say, well, I'll help you. Let's go after him. Let's knock him right out. But Rome said, no, thanks, no, we're not going to do that. And when Rome, when Rome won the war against Antiochus III and imposed the Treaty of Apamea on him, um, they didn't return any lands to Ptolemy that he had lost. See, during all these wars, Ptolemy had lost this land up in here. And Rome won it all in the war with Antiochus III. Rome didn't return any of that to Ptolemy. Um, and he made claims on it, but sorry, you lose, right? Those lands went to another person. To um, I think um, th those lands went to a kingdom of Pergamum. And he will set his face, this is Antiochus III again, <laughs> he will set his face to come with the authority of all his kingdom and, uh, and his upright ones with him, the upright ones with him. Remember the Jews? They, they, they joined him, Antiochus III, right? And this he will do. And a daughter of the woman he shall give to him, destroying her. He will give to the king of the kingdom of the south. And she will not stand and not be for him. So this is talking about Antiochus III as a gesture of peace towards Ptolemy V. Now Ptolemy V at this time was 16 years old. So he still has advisors work doing most of the work for him, right? Um, now this peace was negotiated by Rome. Antiochus gave his daughter, Cleopatra I, who was 10 years old, to Ptolemy, who was 16, as a wife. Now, this isn't the famous Cleopatra. This is uh, the Cleopatra the first, the famous one with Mark Antony and Julius Caesar. That's Cleopatra the seventh. So, she she's like a a direct descendant of her. Okay, so so Antiochus gives his daughter Cleopatra the first to Ptolemy as a wife, and they were married in 193 B.C. in Raphia. Because she was the queen, 
Cleopatra was also officially named the sister of Ptolemy V to be in line with Egyptian tradition because in Egypt it was all in the family for the pharaohs, right? The pharaoh would marry his sister and they would have children together and then the children would marry each other and that's the way the pharaoh king lineages worked. So they called Cleopatra Ptolemy's sister. And Ptolemy V died in 180 BC at the age of 30. And Cleopatra's son, who was six years old, was crowned king. And Cleopatra ruled as a co-regent. Cleopatra ended the plans for a war against Antiochus III. Because they were still planning war, the, the, the counselors. She ended it. And um, Cleopatra I died in 177 BC, leaving her son Ptolemy VI. So her son from Ptolemy V. So she, she, she died leaving her son on the throne. And he married his sister, Cleopatra II. And this intermarriage, keeping one bloodline on the throne, continued until the fall of Egypt under Cleopatra the seventh. Cleopatra the seventh, remember she had the love affair with Julius Caesar and Mark Antony and Augustus Caesar invaded Egypt, committed suicide, I think, and Cleopatra found him dead and she committed suicide beside him. And then um, Augustus Caesar found out that them two had had a son together a son of Julius Caesar and Cleopatra. And Augustus Caesar, his famous line was, there can only be one Caesar. And so he had the child Caesar executed. So that was the end of Cleopatra's line. Her bloodline is over. And a daughter of woman he will give to him, destroying her. It destroyed her. Her bloodline was stuck in itself, right? And she will not stand and not be for him. So she wasn't on his side and she wasn't against him. She stopped the invasion from going into the north, but she didn't help him either. And he will return his face he will return his face to the islands or the coasts and he will take many and a chief will cause to end his own reproach and cause his reproach to return to him. Antiochus III then marched on Pergamum and Thrace. So Antiochus, he marched on Pergamum and took that and then he went across the Hellespont into Thrace and he marched up into here. Right? Saying th because these lands were, were taken over by Seleucus I, like the first general, or the Didoshi. And he always thought of this as his, his land, right? So he went up there and went after the coasts, right? And, that, and after, these are all coastal cities, right? The Romans sent ambassadors to Antiochus demanding that he set these lands free, but he refused. And Hannibal, General Hannibal, from the Punic Wars, he left Carthage and joined Antiochus and he became his military advisor. So this made Rome even more angry, right? And in Greece, the, Ach the Achaean League joined with Rome while the Aetolian League joined with Antiochus III, making him their commander-in-chief. So these are the leagues within the Greek city-states, right? So now, now, uh, so now Greece is split over between Rome and Antiochus. One half of Greece is, uh, is on Rome's side and the other half is on Antiochus' side. Because Greece didn't like, a good part of Greece didn't like Rome either. 
because Greece was imposing or Rome was imposing on Greece what they called the Greek peace because there, these Greek kings like all these city states kept having designs on attacking Rome so Rome kind of imposed this Roman peace over all of Greece and they weren't too happy about that either some of them were and some of them weren't so half joined Rome half joined Antiochus so this is talking like you see the introduction to Rome where I talked about where I talked he that comes against him I sort of went over the wars between Antiochus and and Rome just to introduce Rome but this here is going over those wars between Antiochus and Rome but in more detail than what I said okay so he said as a authority to come against his all of his kingdom and the uprights with him and he's he sent this Cleopatra to Ptolemy and then he went up to and attacked into Asia Minor and into Greece and he returned to the fortress of his own land now this is when the Romans Im imposed uh, the Treaty of Apamea on him, right? And then, so he will return his face to the fortress of his own land and he will stumble and fall and not be found. So after the battle, uh, after the Treaty of Apamea and the peace with Ptolemy was made, um, then Antiochus III turned his face back towards here, towards this land. And because they had revolted, of course, because he was busy over here. So he goes back here, and somewhere in here he, he robs a temple, and, and the locals all got revolted, and Antiochus III was killed in that revolt. So that's what it means. He will return his face to the fortress of his own land and he will stumble and fall and not be found. He died. And, it, and he will stand up in, upon his base a passer through, exacting tribute in the glory of a kingdom. But in a few days he will be broken and not in anger and not in battle. So he's, he's like... It's almost like he's carrying the prophecies carrying on about the same person, but it's actually talking about his son. It's the same kingdom. Because after the death of Antiochus, Seleucus IV began to re rebuild the navy. And he used a, a heavy taxation uh, system for rebuilding his navy. And he had a bureaucrat named Helidorus, who was uh, probably the tax collector. And Helidorus, um, Seleucus was assassinated. Um, they figure, historians figure it was Helidorus who did it. Um, probably, because he put himself on the throne by doing that. And Seleucus IV left his son Demetrius I as his heir. And Demetrius I was a hostage in Rome. And when he, when, when Seleucus IV died, Helidorius was ruling in his place because the heir was a hostage in Rome. So this is a, the standing up, a passer through exacting tribute in the glory of a kingdom. In a few days he will be broken, not in anger, not in battle. It was by intrigue of his tax collector, right? And a despised one will stand upon his base. And they will not give to him the majesty of a kingdom. He will come in peace and he will hold a kingdom by flatteries. Now flatteries, that's like empty words, empty promises, you know, a typical politician, right? Okay, so what what was this about? This was Antiochus and this was Antiochus the fourth. He was the younger son of Antiochus the third, 
and he was held hostage in Rome, but he had been replaced by his younger brother, Demetrius I, and, and Antiochus IV had been placed in Athens as, um, to live out his life in Athens. And when he heard of the death of his brother in the Seleucid Empire, he made his way back to the Seleucid Empire and he seized the throne for himself away from the, the tax collector Helidorius. And Antiochus IV sent an embassy to Rome with a part of the payment that was required by the, the Treaty of Apamea and he strengthened his alliance with Rome. So he appeased Rome by giving them money and and set himself on the throne. So this is Antiochus IV. And he's the bad guy, okay? Now, here's where it gets a little messy. With the arms of a flood, they will be flooded out from before him, and they will be broken, and also the, a leader of a covenant. Now, historians and Bible study experts for decades or for hundreds, for, for centuries have been talking about, um, maybe not centuries, because this is sort of deeper prophecy. It's probably for a hundred years have been talking about this as be, being talking about um, Antiochus IV, because Antiochus IV, who, he was the one who um, began to go after the Jews, and he raided the temple for money, he um, kicked the, the high priest out of the temple and offered pig's flesh on the altar, he built gymnasiums to, to try to Hellenize the Jews, teach them Greek gods and Greek customs. And there ended up being a revolt against him, which was the Maccabean revolt. So, so they're saying, okay, he broke the leader of a covenant is when he replaced the high priest in, in the temple with his brother, with the brother of the high priest, who was more of a Hellenizer type of guy. Now, there's a lot of um, debate over this, a lot of disagreements over this. And from here on, it, it doesn't, it's not the most accurate prophecy in the Bible. Like up to this part, it's the most accurate prophecy in the Bible. But from here on, it gets messy. And historians and even Bible teachers will call this a failed prophecy because they think it's talking about Antiochus IV. And if you look at it as Antiochus IV, it does fail. But we have to look at it from another angle because we have to look at it from a Christian angle. Now, the leader of a covenant or leader, here's the, the Hebrew here, Nagid Berit. Um, Berit is a covenant, not the covenant. If it was the covenant, it would say Habarit. But it's just a covenant. And Nagid is a leader. Okay? And also, Vegam, and also the leader of a covenant. And also a leader of a covenant. That's what it says, okay? A leader of our covenant. So what covenant and what leader is the question at hand? Okay? So this is where, you know, we can turn a failed prophecy into not a failed prophecy. Because we're not going to go down the... 
we're going to look at both of the both of these interpretations and we'll see how the one fails the one talking about Antiochus Epiphanes Antiochus the fourth um, that one fails if you follow it through the history and we will see that I'll follow that through and we'll see how it fails but we're also going to follow another road that doesn't fail okay so now first of all I'm going to talk about the covenant all right if we look at Jeremiah chapter 31 now Jeremiah was a prophet in Jerusalem who was a prophet just before and during the time when Babylon destroyed Jerusalem destroyed the first temple and they were all taken captive to Babylon and and the the city of the country of Judea and the country of Israel was then laid waste completely and the Jews were taken captive away into Babylon and so Jeremiah is prophesying here just before this happens and he said and God is talking through Jeremiah he's saying behold the days come says the Lord that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt so that's the covenant under Moses, not according to the covenant under Moses, which my covenant they broke, although I was a husband to them. So they broke that covenant, although I didn't break it. Okay, says the Lord. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days. So he's talking about the days when Jerusalem will be destroyed. I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts. And I will be their God and they will be my people. And they will teach it no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother saying know the Lord. For they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. Okay, so this is the new covenant, right? So this is the new covenant that the Christians talk about under Jesus, right? And that's the old covenant under Moses. So here's right here in Jeremiah chapter 31 is described the new and the old covenant. So if we look at this as the old covenant is broken and the new covenant is not yet made because the new covenant comes under Jesus Christ then what covenant like what covenant are we talking about Daniel chapter 9 right um, know there and understand from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem this is after the destruction by Babylon Daniel's praying to God when will Jerusalem be rebuilt? Because it was prophesied it would be rebuilt. When are we going to come back into this covenant? When are we going to, uh, you know, restore the kingdom? So he's saying, okay, the, the answer is from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem to the Messiah, the Prince, will be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. The street shall be built in the wall in troublous times. And after the three score and two weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. That's Jesus crucified, not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come, the Romans, shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. And the end shall be with a flood. And unto the end of the war, desolations are determined. And he, this is talking about Jesus now. And he will confirm the covenant with many for one week. This is the new covenant, right? And in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease. Because Jesus died on the cross, he is the sacrifice to end all sacrifices. 
He's the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world, right? So, um, so this is the covenant. Like, now, what covenant are we talking about? What leader of what covenant are we talking about here in Daniel chapter 11? And they will be broken, also the leader of a covenant. So, is this another, see, see, what I'm proposing here is that, okay, Antiochus IV, he's working for Rome. He grew up in Rome. He's never, be, he's never even been in his own country his whole life. He was in Rome, and then he was in Athens, and he's never, probably never met a Jew in his whole life. And now he comes back and takes the kingdom. And he pays Rome for the Treaty of Apamea. He makes a payment. His father never paid. He, re he refused. He always had problems with Rome. So now this guy pays Rome saying, I'm going to be a good puppet king, Rome. So don't come to war with me. So now he's their puppet king. So, this is talking about Rome. With the arms of a flood, they will be flooded out from before him. The, all these kingdoms, the Ptolemies were flooded out by Augustus Caesar, may, turned Egypt into a province. Um, uh, Pompeii turned the Seleucid holdings of Judea into a province and he turned several he turned chunks of it into different provinces the province of Asia the province of um, Syria the province of Judea the province of Egypt these became Roman provinces so this this is another f forecast of the coming ruler Rome and with the arms of the flood, they will be flooded out from before him, and they will be broken, and also the leader of a covenant. This is Jesus, right? He will be broken, but not for himself. You see, this is still going back to Daniel's earlier prophecies. If you look, um, if we look at Daniel... Um, Daniel 7, okay? This is the... Uh, he saw in a night vision four winds of heaven strove upon the great sea and four beasts came out of the sea, right? And we'll scroll ahead, okay? Um, so when, when the angel's explaining it, okay? These great beasts are four kings which shall rise out of the earth. But the saints of the Most High will take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever and ever and ever. Then I would know the truth of the fourth beast. So the three, the four beasts, what are they? Uh, they're, um, what was it? The first one was Persia. Second one was Alexander. Third one was the Diadashi. And the fourth one is Rome. The, I would know the truth of the fourth beast that was diverse from all the others. Diverse because it's a republic, it's not a kingdom, right? Exceedingly dreadful, whose teeth were iron, iron age, and his nails of brass, and he devoured and broken pieces and stamped the residue with his feet. He devoured all the other kingdoms, okay? And the ten horns that were on his head and of the other which came up before, before whom three fell. We'll, we'll be coming back to this later. And even of that horn that had eyes and a mouth and spoke great things, whose look was more stout than his fellows, I beheld the same horn made war with the saints and prevailed against them until the Ancient of Days came in judgment. So right up until Judgment Day, this, this horn made war with the saints and prevails against them. And, and until the time came, the saints possessed the kingdom. That's the millennial rule of Christ, right? 
Thus he said, The fourth beast is a fourth kingdom, which shall be diverse from all kingdoms, because it's a republic, and it shall devour the whole earth, and shall tread it down and break it in pieces. And the ten horns... So, so if you get the idea of this, this is not talking about Antiochus IV, right? This is talking about Rome. So Daniel chapter 8. There is another vision, okay? I was in Shushan, the palace, and I saw a vision. And behold, there stood before me a ram and two horns, and the ram was higher... The ram with the two horns, okay? And uh, out of one of the horns came the little horn. Okay, this is um, the same kind of the same kind of vision, but yet another version of it, right? See, now that being broken, that's Alexander the Great. Four kingdoms so stand out of the nation. That's the, the Diadashi but not in his power, and in the latter time of their kingdom, okay, so at the end of the Diodashi's kingdom, when the transgressors are come to the full, this is Antiochus, Ptolemies, the Greeks, all these um, continually fighting each other, right? A king of fierce countenance and understanding dark sentences or um, complicated sentences will stand up and his power shall be mighty but not by his own power and he shall destroy wonderfully and prosper and practice and destroy the mighty, mighty and holy people. Right? And through his policy he shall cause craft to prosper and he shall magnify his, himself in his heart and by peace he will destroy many he will stand against the prince of princes, Jesus Christ, and he shall be broken without hand. Okay, so it's still the same. He's talking about the same events, right? So why would, in Daniel chapter 9 that we just looked at, is the, the 70 weeks, okay? And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, Jesus Christ, for seven years, okay? Um, was the, for three and a half years, Jesus um, preached to the Jews. Then he was crucified in the middle of it, right? And then in three and a half years, the gospel went to the Jews after that. And that's the seven years. After that seven years, the gospel went to the Gentiles. Okay, and there's the overspreading of abominations. This is the little horn, even until the end, right? So it's still the same prophecy. It's been from different perspectives. So in, ten, in chapter 10, that's the angel visiting Daniel. In chapter 11 is what we're studying now. So it's still the same prophecy. It's just in greater detail. So... Um, you know, to end it all at Antiochus the Fourth, kind of cuts off like, where's the great iron beast? You know, where's where's the little horn? Where's where's all these things that are going to happen, right? Where he will prevail against the saints. Now, they take it as okay, it's it's the the Maccabean revolt, but they actually prevailed. If you look at it that way, the saints prevailed. Because the Maccabean revolt started the Jewish kingdom. So that's a failed prophecy. But it's not failed. Because we have to look at it in the right way. So I think at that we're going to end this video. And in our next video. We're going to carry on from here. And we're going to look at two perspectives of this prophecy. One of a perspective of is it Rome? And the other one is it Antiochus the Fourth. Um, which one fits better? Which one fails, and which one does not fail? So, I'll see you in the next video, and don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to keep the uh, videos active. I thank you very much.